Authorities are warning that toothpaste tubes might be used for terrorist attacks on airplanes. And what is it exactly that terrorists want in time or in eternity? Mitt Romney, Rand Paul, who's going to be the next GOP presidential hopeful? Folks, we're going to go from Sochi to Washington. This is the voice of resistance. Standing for truth in the four corners of America. Fighting for justice on the frontiers of the culture wars. And turning resistance into an art form. Randall Terry. One is tempted to feel bad for the Russians and for Vladimir Putin and all of the hardworking Russians that have put together the 2014 Winter Games, which are now starting. Feel bad for them because the threat of terrorism is looming large over them. The State Department in America released a warning to airlines about toothpaste. I repeat, toothpaste because they've got credible data, credible findings, credible, credible evidence that shows that there are terrorists who are going to squeeze the toothpaste out. They're not content just to fight cavities. And they're going to fill the toothpaste, toothpaste containers with explosives that can be mixed together on airplanes. And will take out a lot more than the dingy color of the teeth. It could take out the side of the airplane and bring the plane down. Meanwhile, what normally would be hustling and bustling with foreign tourists, the Soki games thus far have almost no people from outside the country. Remember, Vladimir Putin has spent over $50 billion of Russia's money to create a massive resort that they hope to be a, a winter resort after the games are over. Only seven of the 10 hotels are done. And one of the reasons that they have not been able to finish the hotels is because they decided that some of the foreign workers were a threat to security. So they've got the toothpaste threat. People are saying, I'm not flying then. They've got hotels that are not finished and we've got reporters from around the world that are really whining about some of the conditions. And uh, one vendor, actually said that she had seen, a Russian vendor had seen one foreigner, one, a woman from South Korea. She might have been fleeing from a terrorist threat from Kim Jong-il, I don't know. But anyway, we don't know how many foreigners are going to be there. Most of us Americans who enjoy the Winter Games, I know that I and my family do, we're gonna be watching from the safety of our living rooms. I wanna to read to you, as, as I've looked at this um, impending threat of terrorism. And there is history, such as the 1972 Munich Games, where the PLO uh, captured and murdered Israeli athletes. There is history of terrorism being used at an Olympic game. I, I started to think again about terrorism. For those of you who don't know, I, I have a master's degree from a military school in diplomacy and international terrorism. So this is something that is a passion for me. I want to read you a quote and see what you think about this quote. <clears throat> the difference between the revolutionary and the terrorist lies in the reason for which each fights. For whoever stands by a just cause and fights for the freedom and liberation of his land from the invaders, the settlers, and the colonialists cannot possibly be called terrorist. Who do you think said that? I mean, I think that the British would have argued that the American revolutionaries were terrorists, right? I mean, our soldiers were uh, committing acts in a time of war that the British and the normal rules of war at that time consider terrorism. In other words, rather than have two battles meet, or rather two armies meet on a field of battle, the Americans who were outmanned and outgunned 
They were hiding in trees along the roadway or behind trees, and they were ambushing British soldiers. So an American might have been able to use most of those words. The difference between the revolutionary and the terrorist, terrorist lies in the reason for, each, for which each fights. Whoever stands by a just cause, fights for freedom and liberation of his homeland from invaders, the settlers, the colonialists, cannot possibly be called a terrorist. Who do you think said those words? Get ready to be shocked. Yep, there he is, Yasser Arafat. He said that in a speech at the United Nations defending what PLO terrorists did at the Munich Games. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to look at why nations of the world cannot agree on a definition of terrorism and what do terrorists have to gain? What would they have to gain in this exact instant and what would they have to gain overall in their execution of what many people would call an act of terrorism? And one other thing, a poll that's blood-curdling. I mean, that's something to look forward to, a blood-curdling poll. My wife and I, for five years, have been grinding our own wheat and baking our own bread from scratch. Within two hours, you can have fresh wheat in your hand and then piping hot bread come out of the oven. The most nutritious and delicious bread you will ever have. And we do it for under a dollar a loaf. Call Paula's Bread and find out about this grain mill and the mixer and how it can save you money and change your life. Well, let's go right to the blood-curdling poll. I'll give you some background. There are a lot of people in both diplomatic circles and scholarly circles who make the argument that there is a direct link between economic oppression or poverty and terrorism. All right? You've heard it before. Well, the reason that they're doing this is because they don't have economic opportunity. They're frustrated and they're committing these acts of terror to create a better world economically for themselves. In 2001, June 1st, 2001, a group of terrorists, Muslim terrorists, blew up, bombed a building in Tel Aviv. It was the Dolphinarium Discotheque. 21 Israeli youths were killed. 120 were injured. It was a horrific scene of death and carnage and mayhem. Well, two scholars after this bombing decided that they were going to conduct an in-depth poll of Palestinians, all right? Alan Kruger and Jitka Malekova, I'm sorry, Malakova. They two scholars, and they said, let's find out what's in the head of Palestinians who had nothing to do with this attack. What they found was bone chilling. 80% of the people that they polled did not believe that what happened at the Dolphinarium was a terrorist act. 80%. Now, in other polling that was also done, people around the world, okay, 92% of people from Western non-Islamic nations, 92% believed that the attack on the discotheque was an act of terrorism. 80% of Palestinians did not. But it gets even worse. The poll showed that there was no difference based upon gender, age, education, or economic status. Think about it. Moms and grandmas, who you would think would have a, an emotive response to the death of these poor kids who just went out to dance at a discotheque. You would think that women would have some gender bias against an act of terror like this. Nope. Well, you'd think that the elderly would have wisdom, no? You'd think that the better educated 
would say, well, of course this is a terrorist act. No. And then germane to the issue at hand was that the wealthy and the poor and the middle class who were polled did not think it was a terrorist act. The point is so glaring. It's the words of Yasser Arafat. If somebody believes that what they're doing is in pursuit of justice and that they have no other means at their disposal, then it cannot possibly be called a terrorist act. Now, I want to quickly say I reject that notion for a couple of reasons. Number one, the very definition of justice has to be established. In Yasser Arafat's quote, he said, if someone's fighting for what is just, stop, stop, hold the press. Who gets to define justice? Who gets to define what is just? For example, in the so-called Arab Spring, which the Muslim Brotherhood unleashed upon many nations of the Middle East, we see that the goal was not simply the toppling of the current government, but also the institution of Sharia law. Okay? Is Sharia law just? Is the way that Coptic Christians are being treated in Egypt under Sharia law, is that just? Can anyone argue that that's freedom? The definitions of the words matter, and which leads to my second point, namely, that who gets to define the rules of war matters. In other words, in an Augustinian, St. Augustine, in an Augustinian just war theory, you don't kill non-combatants. You don't kill women. You don't kill the elderly. And yet, as a part of the Islamic terrorist framework, and yes, I do believe it is Islamic terrorism. I guess I've tipped my hand. In the Islamic terrorist framework, which they call fighting for freedom and justice, they are perfectly content to kill non-combatants. They are perfectly content to kill women. When a bomb goes off, clearly they're content to kill children. And the goal that they are seeking to achieve by the implementation of Sharia law is inherently oppressive toward non-Muslims. And now you'll see why a Muslim state is never going to agree to a definition of terrorism that is anchored in justice and freedom as defined by Judeo-Christian ethics or by St. Augustine or by the Augustine theory of just war. Do you want to have knowledge, wisdom, discernment? If so, you have to read good books, theology, history, books that look at the lives of great men and women. So to help you to become a more effective Christian, a better witness for truth, somebody who can engage in productive conversation that exhorts and edifies those that you speak with, we're gonna do something crazy. We're offering you these seven books for a gift of any size. You just pay for the shipping and handling and then give whatever gift that you can and we will send them to you. But just to make it a little bit more crazy, I will send you a second copy of my three books autographed. You can give them as a gift to your pastor or to a family member and help extend truth and justice in the world. This is While Supplies Last. My wife and I were talking this morning before we filmed and about what was in the news, and she said, take some time and explain to people what the terrorists have to gain by using acts of terrorism. And by the way, when my wife makes a request like that, I'm going to grant it usually, especially with all that I put her through so that I could get my master's degree. <laughs> she was one of those college widows, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you know, some of you guys know as well. We thank our spouses who allowed us to continue our education when it was a lot of hard work and it meant time away from families. Anyway, um, so let's, let's look at a couple things. There's the eternal and then there's the temporal. And now I'm focusing 
first on Islamic terrorism and then I'll, I'll branch out into other forms of terrorism such as Marxist terrorism. On the eternal side, it's well established and, and you can go to our website voiceofresistance.com and you can look at some of my research papers where I have very dispassionate quotes from Mohammed, the founder of Islam, that explain over and over that the jihadist, the person who is involved in jihad, holy war for Allah, that if they slay or are slain in battle, especially if they are killed in battle, that they will obtain multiple virgins, that they will obtain heaven, that the very blood that comes from their wounds will smell like musk, which is an aphrodisiac cologne for those of you who don't know that, that it'll smell like musk in, in Allah's presence. So when you catechize, when you disciple, when you train a child, a young boy, like has been shown in various clips from around the world of young boys saying that they want to grow up to die to be a martyr. When you train someone to think that way and it's actually in their soul, you're fighting against something far more powerful than the Marxist terrorists had. Because a Marxist terrorist wants to live. He doesn't want to die. He's a, generally an atheist. He doesn't believe that there's going to be a reward for him after the grave, so he, he wants to live to establish the Marxist state. But the Muslim terrorist is fighting for the temporal and the eternal. He's trying to get Sharia law. He's trying to get a Muslim state. But if he dies in the process and gets perpetual virgins, and his very blood smells like a, a, an aphrodisiac to woo these virgins in the next life, that's even better in his mind, right? And it had hit me with fresh intensity. The place that blood plays in eternity. The Christian faith teaches that because of the shed blood of Christ, we sinners can be redeemed and spend eternity with God. The Muslim religion teaches that the shed blood of the jihadist, his own shed blood, purchases his redemption. It's a frightening distinction. And it shows how difficult it is to fight against them. Because somebody who's not afraid to die, who actually thinks that in death there will be a reward, that's a fierce opponent. Now on the temporal side, what do they get? Well, obviously they get fear. They get headlines. They get their message to be heard. Remember, most scholars agree that terrorism is not for the dead, it's for the living, all right? When somebody commits a murder, a premeditated murder, usually their goal is to kill somebody and that was the goal. So what they did, the act of bloodshed, of slaying another human being, the goal was executed for the dead. But in terrorism, who, the, those who die are al almost insignificant. Or what matters is that it strikes terror and fear in the hearts of other people so that there can be the hearing of a message and a public policy change. Those are the two things. And that's what happened with the PLO when they killed those Israeli athletes in 1972. The PLO went from obscurity to international prominence and their message was heard and we have literally watched a 40-year struggle of implementing their desired public policy change, which is a free Palestinian state. So what the terrorist is after, for the Islamic terrorist, and then for any terrorist, is to strike fear in the heart of the living in order that the message is heard. What do they, what do they want? What do they want? And then there is a corresponding public policy change, a change in the position of the government a change in the, the geographic borders of a government, freedom granted to a certain people, etc. Allah <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Friends, this is a demonic, satanic counterfeit. The devil knows that blood is required for salvation. He knows it's the blood of Christ. And yet, he has produced this counterfeit that says, no, it's not the blood of Jesus you need to be saved. It's your own blood that will purchase your redemption as you seek to kill and murder other people. If that's not born from hell, I don't know what is. Do you want to get America out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the republic before our eyes and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. Take advantage of it today. Let's talk about presidential politics, the upcoming presidential election, and terrorism. One of the reasons that I am so thankful to live in this country is because we have the peaceful transition of power. For the most part, we have had a wonderfully successful experiment in self-government. If you look at acts of terrorism over the last 100 years, you'll find an awful lot of them that were Marxist in nature, all right? And communist activists and agitators and terrorists were successful in toppling governments, uh, enslaving people in fear and in terror, and acquiring their communist Marxist utopia, which as we now are watching and have been watching, is crumbling all over the world. Khrushchev once said, if my memory is correct, that we'll beat them without firing a shot. We will defeat them without firing a shot. Now that proved to be not true for the most part, but the policy objectives of Marxism, communism, or socialism, which is communism on the half shell, many of those objectives have been obtained in America without firing a shot. Um, Romney is back in the news, Mitt Romney, because he said unequivocally he is not running for president in 2016. And that's because he was in the news because a recent poll in New Hampshire showed him to be in first place, <laughs> all right? And he's not even saying he's gonna run. Second place was Rand Paul. Now that got my attention in a very happy way because President Rand Paul would bring about genuine policy changes. All right, let's set aside for a minute what I believe are the two most critical ethical issues we face, the protection of the unborn and the protection of true marriage. Rand Paul supports both those, but he is not a Marxist. He is not a socialist. And in his heart of hearts, he would work for the slow dismantling of the socialist plantation, the savior state. If we are going to survive economically, which is looking like it's not going to happen, but if it was going to happen, we are going to have to have a president that will bring about true policy changes in the socialist welfare plantation. And for that to happen, we've got to have somebody with the vision and the guts to do it. That's why I'm interested in Rand Paul.